Hey guys, we're back. Hi! Um, hi. We're back for our Q&A portion of Doom Club 2, a session 2. Uh, before we get into it though, for my peeps out there who are reading from a book opposite of this book, not this edition, let's find the last words of the next chapter so you guys can like know where to stop. Um, okay. 166, let's see here. Um, I am not dot 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 yet I occurred so that is the last word of the next session session three so stop when you get there um, all right so uh, before we get into our Q&A though let's let's do a little bit of thing let's talk a little bit uh, dune wave is available I'm not sure if it's available today already or maybe it's available tomorrow but it'll be on um, you can download it with Apple Music um, or on Spotify. Uh, there's some downloading options for there. We're also going to put uh, put it on um, my channel, the the main one, like the, the one that I just played you that has all the songs on it. And then I believe Akira will be putting the singles on his channel. So there'll be that as well. Uh, so yeah, if you're interested in the Dune Wave, check it out on SoundCloud, uh, Akira the Dawn, SoundCloud, Apple, all those things. So yeah, I hope you guys, uh, I hope you guys check it out. It's pretty awesome. It's pretty cool, right? It's pretty fucking cool. Um, yeah, you can stream on Spotify and Apple. Yep, it's out now. Good, perfect. So yes, uh, yeah, Akira's here. Akira's in the house. What's up, bro? <laughs> How's it going? Uh, thank you so much for creating this awesome piece of art with me. This is like so cool. I'm like so excited. As somebody who um, you know, Dazzler is like my favorite mutant, you know, she's like a disco mutant. And it's like, I'm not really a great singer. I can sing a little bit, but I'm, I'm more of like accompaniment, you know, like I'm an alto. I can sing some harmony with some people. I'm not really this. I don't need to be out front. Um, but I do have dreams of, of being uh, on stage. You know, I have my rock star dreams, just like everyone at my disco, my disco dreams. And so this way, I'm finally, I finally get to like, make some music and be a part of something. It's so cool. I'm like, so excited. Um, and also, uh, for my peeps out there, uh, if you want to get some, some Dune Club merch, if you look below, there's a link and, uh, we got some Dune Club shirts left. Our small's already sold out. A lot of you guys have been buying the Dune Club shirt. Not this one. This one's not on sale anymore, but the one that says Dune Club right, right here. And then we also have some Dune Club 2 pins. Uh, I think there might be a couple more of these left. These might already be gone, though. I didn't have a lot of these. These were just left over from our first uh, Dune Club. It's the Atreides banner. Um, I did notice something, though, interesting while reading this, is they said the Atreides banner of green and white. So Paul has, tra has, has changed the banner and took the black off and made it white after his imperial reign, um, which I think is really interesting. Also, there's a litany against fear prayer cards. You can get a signed one of these. Or you can get, I mean, if you buy anything, you're going to get one of these, but it's not going to be necessarily signed. Um, but it has a litany against fear on the back. So you can keep it in your wallet. If you're ever having a fear moment, you can pull it out. You can read the litany to yourself. Or you can download the song and listen to that there. <laughs> you know, it's like, I, I highly recommend memorizing it, though. It, it really does. It is really helpful, and I use it all the time. Um, I use it all the time. I have so many Dune quotes memorized, it's bonkers. And also, uh, if you get like anything, like I also, I have all these leftover um, God Emperor. Here's me as a worm god. Uh, we got some of these bookmarks as well that come free with whatever you, whatever you purchase to support Dune Club. So thank you so much, guys. Um, and yeah, uh, also just, let's just take a look at this Dune Tarot real quick. We're just going to talk about my shit. And I, I did see, I was kind of peeping on the, um, I'm a, I'm a peeper. <laughs> I'm the peeper. Uh, I was peeping on the chat and I saw, uh, Magnus Danger, uh, you, you were saying that you are a sometimes stage magician and mentalist and that, uh, you feel that, um, the tarot and astrology, uh, are used to manipulate people by charlatans and things like that and it's like I totally get where you're coming from uh, I you're not uh, you're not 100 wrong you know it's like there are absolutely people who use these things to take advantage of people um, but it's again it's a double-edged sword it's just like anything like not everyone like I think like yeah there are some people who learn these who learn these systems in order to scam people absolutely like that's something that goes on for sure but I mean that happens in medicine 
that happens in any profession, really. I mean, there's scam artists in anything, you know, in anything. There's scam artists, mechanics. I mean, there's so it's like, again, like don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know, it's like, yeah, there's a lot of scammy shit going on and there's a lot of lame shit going on. But there is actually some real shit going on in there, too. And then it's so and it's there's a thing where it's like astrology has been around for like thousands and thousands and thousands of years. You know, I mean, heads of state have relied on this for like a long time. Like, is there's it's like it's it's. Uh, you know, it's worth exploring, but at the same time, you know, it's like, you don't need to like, oh, the, the, my horoscope said this, like that's kind of, there's, there's bullshitty parts of it. And then there's more chill parts of it that are cool. And, um, I know a lot of, I know astrologers, like people who are doing it and they didn't learn it because, I mean, it's a lot to learn. I mean, really, are you really going to learn all about astrology just to scam somebody? Cause that's a lot of learning to do just to scam somebody. There's a lot easier ways to scam people. So, um, I mean, there are people that I know who who have done uh, astrology and tarot professionally and they genuinely believe in what they're doing and they're not trying to scam people. Um, and it can be help, it can be very helpful. And another thing that a lot of people don't think about is um, every now and then, like, I mean, I read my own cards a lot, but every now and then you, you need somebody else. <laughs> like sometimes you just need to hear some shit from other people. And um, there's definitely been times where I've popped down to the psychic eye on um, on Ventura. And I met this really amazing woman named Allura. Uh, and she is phenomenal. And I've seen her a couple of times. And, like, she's really helped me when I've been stuck and told me things I needed to hear. And regardless of whether... Um, it's it's like it's like cheap therapy, you know. I mean, it's like it's cheaper than therapy to go to like a card reader or to go like the certain. If you find a good one, it's just like it's way cheaper. It's a it's a way great place to go to talk to your problems, you know. Because a lot of people we don't have we can't really talk to our problems. So it's like if nothing else, it works as a, a kind of therapy for people um, who can't afford actual therapy. You know, so it's like it, it has its uses. It has its uses. Don't be cynical. Don't be completely cynical about it. Um, but yeah, and it's also, I mean, one thing that about astrology that I really like is that it just, and tarot, is that it just gets you to think about things, you know, it just gives you something to, uh, to think about with yourself and compare things. And you, you say you read about like, oh, you find out I'm an Aquarius and you go read about Aquarius and then you're like, oh, these things really line up, but these things don't line up, you know, but it, at least it's getting you to think about yourself in these terms. Um, cause a lot of people don't think about themselves in these terms. And it's like, it provides these archetypes where you can compare and contrast yourself and learn more about yourself just by thinking about it and, and observing it. Um, and uh, here's something, and let's just let's just read a little bit from the Dune Encyclopedia. Hey, this is the Dune Encyclopedia, guys. I love this book. This is so much fun. I was getting into it last night. And I, I read something that the, perfectly goes with this is, um, meaning resides not in the cards, but in the mind of the reader. The cards provide only a focus and symbology for the channeling of the energy, for the clearing of the vision, for the opening of the eyes of the seeker. So it's like, the thing is, is like, again, it's like the, the cards aren't magic. You know, that's not the deal. It's like, it's just giving you, the reader, a focus. You know, it's like, they're they're just cards, but it's like they provide these archetypes and these focuses and they, make, they bring things to your mind when you're reading them. And these things, it's like, sometimes it's easier to, um, you know, have these thoughts when you think that it's like coming from from somewhere else when really it is it all comes from you like we project everything onto our universe everything we're doing is a projection onto our universe but we like to pretend like it's an external universe that everything's just like reflecting on you um but yeah so there's you know there's stuff that can it's not all it's not all charlatanry but I mean, honestly, like I get triggered by doctors. Like I get, I get more triggered by like fucking doctors than I do from anybody. I'm just like, I don't trust you, motherfucker. Like dentists and doctors. I'm just like, I don't trust y'all. I don't think y'all know what the fuck you're talking about. I think you guys are fucking lame. I think you're just, you know, like I'm just like so like I'm like so on guard when I go deal with like any any of that sort of stuff because it's like there. You wanna you wanna talk about motherfucking charlatans, dentistry, okay, dentistry. Those people are scamming you guys. We're scamming all of us so hard, so hard, so hard. I mean, so many unnecessary root canals, so many unnecessary things that are going on. Um, you, you know, you want to you want to talk about some fucked up shit and people being manipulated. Like, go go to some dentists and see what's going on because those guys, there's a lot of thievery going on, and there's a lot of thief. I mean, like, how much? I mean, 
how much money medicine, I mean, Western medicine and our, and our whole system, our whole fucked up healthcare system in America is just like, it's just a giant fucking scam. You want to talk about scams? That's the, the medical profession is really ripping people off. It's, it's not the tarot card reader down the street that's, oh, yeah, fuck them. No, fuck these insurance companies. Like, those are the people who are fucking us, like, hard, you know? It's like, God. Anyways. <laughs> Anyways. Um, but it's interesting. This book does have some illustrations, some illustrations of what they think the cards would look like. This is just some of the, the major arcana cards. We have the Great Mother, the Universe, Wawi, Alat, Ixion, the Great Worm, and the Wanderer. Um, so these are cool. I, you know, I would do it a little differently. Maybe I would, I would do it a little differently. One thing, though, that I think is odd in this, and this is something that bothers me, is like, okay, so in the, in the chapter, she says the Eight of Ships. So I'm like, okay, the ships is a suit. But then when I'm reading in here about the suits, it says the suits are knives, globes, staves, and basins. So whoever wrote this article in this encyclopedia was not paying attention because ships is supposed to be one. And I think that ships is awesome. If I had to replace the suits of the tarot with suits of this, it's like I would say the ships would be... I would either place it as pentacles or maybe wands, maybe wands, because it's like pentacles are like resources and wands is like the will and like wa like wands because it's like ships, like they fly things here and there, you know, and they're like the will that's like kind of driving the universe, like they're like a delivery system. Um, so that could work, but also it could work as resources because they do like, I mean, all the resources that everybody has kind of, if you're going to trade, it goes through the guild, but I kind of like them better for wands. I don't know. What do you think? Um, but I do like knives, like a Chris knife instead of a sword would be cool. I don't know. It's, there's a lot of stuff in here, but, um, this is cool, but it talks about all the different, it names all the different major arcana cards. Um, and it talks a little bit about them and what they look like. And uh, it's really, it's a fun, it's a fun article to read. So if you're interested in Dune, Tarot, Dune, whatever, uh, check it out. Um, also, just want to say to my peeps who, who have bought some, some Dune merch, I, I totally, I got to put these in the mail on Monday. I've got like a billion of these things. I had to like get a whole new fucking shipping uh, program. I had to learn it. And I'm, oh, man, I couldn't get it to print for a couple days. <laughs> I finally figured it out. Like I had to call their people, whatever. Um, ah. Okay, so let us get in to our Q&A without further ado. Michael Game Master uh, asks, if you had to pick a favorite character besides the main character, who would it be and why? Um, I would say in this book, Alia is my favorite character. Um, I think that she's just, Tina Alia is the best. I don't know, she just, she's so exciting. And I, I feel, I personally, like, I feel like I am... Um, I resonate with her a little bit because it's like she's young but she's like old at the same time and I kind of feel like I'm an old lady <laughs> there's like part of me there's very much a part of me that's very childlike and young but there's also very much a part of me that's very old and tired and just like what you know so it's like I have that that old woman that crone energy inside of me um and so I relate to her you know and I also I mean I also like I get I get her because it's just like she's just um like I was saying, like, she's just way ahead of the curve for most people, and it's very isolating for her. And, you know, who does she talk to? Like, who does she hang out with? Like, who who is possibly going to impress her? Like, you know, it's just like, I don't know. I, I deal with these questions. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Butch Arrington asks, would you consider digging more into the Arabian and Kalahari cultures Herbert based the Fremen on? Yes, actually. There is a, a follower of mine on Twitter who was telling me that he or she, I'm not sure of their gender, uh, are writing a book that talks more about all of like the Islamic influences and the Middle Eastern influences and stuff going on. And so I'm interested to, uh, when, they, when their book comes out, I hope that they would send me, I'm sure they would send me one if I asked them to. Uh, I would be interested, but I also wanna ask them, I'm like, are, I wanna ask them like, are you Muslim? Because I, I prefer that a Muslim tell me about this stuff. <laughs> like, I would prefer, because, like, they would know better. Um, but we'll see. Um, so, Callison the First says, I'm still foggy on why Farrakh is willing to help the conspiracy. 
And what do you think Lady Jessica is up to? Um, we don't get any Lady Jessica in this book, but we do get Lady Jessica in the next book. Um, so she's just chilling on Caladan. She's chilling on Caladan. She's hanging out with Gurney. She's just like relaxing, having a, the, the great life, living the good life. Um, and just like trying to advise everyone from afar. I mean, I like that she is like sending letters and is in, is in communication. Um, and as to why Farrakh is willing to help the conspiracy, I like what Jay Linus came back and he kind of explained it in the comments. Because I like some of you guys go in there and you see a question like, I want to explain this question. It's so great. Um, he says, Farrakh paid a price for Paul's jihad. His son's blindness is a daily reminder of his sacrifice. He also expressed his distaste for the riches of Paul's empire, reminiscing on the old Fremen culture filled with wealth and freedom of purpose. The slain body in the sea may symbolize the reality of the great change brought under Muad'Dib. Remember how symbolic water is to the Fremen? What's worse is Farrakh feels Paul has forgotten my existence. I would be missing more evidence. I could be missing more evidence, but that's some of what I distilled from the chapter. Um, and I think, yeah, I think that you're absolutely right, Jay. Thanks for jumping in there. Um, I think you're totally on to something. And also, I love this thing that he says, Corba says, where um, he says, I owned a Chris knife, water rings to 10 liters, my own lance, which had been my father's, a coffee service, a bottle made of red glass, older than any memory in my siege. I had my own share of our spice, but no money. I was rich and I did not know it. Two wives I had, one plain and dear to me, the other stupid and obstinate, but with the form and face of an angel. I was a Fremen knave, a writer of worms, master of Leviathan and of the sand. You know, it's just like, yes, like, I get it. Like, I mean, now that he has a bunch of money, he realizes, like, that red bottle of glass was way cooler than this fucking mansion that he's built, not mansion, but this Mick mansion that he's built, you know, that he's bought and living in the suburbs and all this stuff. It's like, no... That was way cooler. And here's the thing about change is people don't like it. <laughs> change is chaos. Um, and so Farrakh is like not about it because he's having to pay the price for these changes, pers personal prices for these changes. And it sucks for him. Um, let's see here. Um, so Seth Cordell did ask, as someone who is involved in Christian ministry, I really appreciate the parallels I draw from the Dune series, specifically the correlation between Paul as Jesus and the Jihad as the Crusades, and showing that people can take good, wholesome, love-based teachings and twist them to fit their personal agendas. Since you've spent a prolonged amount of time in the American Christian culture as a kid, do you think this also or am I reaching a bit and obviously no I don't think you're reaching at all I think that's absolutely what's going on I think that's what Frank Herbert's talking about without openly talking about it because there are a lot of people where it's like you mentioned the name Jesus and again they have a triggered reaction they're like oh fuck that you know people shut down um, and so this way he's able to explore these ideas uh, while also kind of like shielding them um, so yeah uh, and then let's see here uh Um, at the start of Irulan and Mohame's conversation, Mohame orders the brother-sister cross breeding must be explored. Could this mean they are considering gene manipulation? I was like, well, yeah, <laughs> like their eugenics program. It's not gene manipulation. It's just a eugenics program. Like they've got a whole eugenics program and they've been doing it for thousands of years. And Paul and Alia are a product of that program and they need to keep keep those genes. Um is Paul actually having visions of his death, asks Bobby McIntyre. He keeps telling himself to disengage, disengage, disengage during visions, and I'm wondering what he's actually seeing. Um, and a lot of people, again, Jay Linus came back, and then uh, Red Sonia's chosen male came back and talked about it, and I think both of their answers were good. But I, I love the disengage thing, because I feel like he's getting drawn into a future, a dark future. We don't know exactly what that future looks like, but he keeps getting drawn into a vision of this future that is not one that he really wants to participate in, but one he seemingly has no choice in. And it's such a, it's such a difficult thing and he keeps getting sucked into it. And I think that the, the disengage, disengage, I think that's like him saying like, stop thinking about it. Like, stop, stop thinking about it right now. Stop, like live in the now, live in the present, live in the now. Like it's to anchor himself to what's going on right now instead of getting sucked into some bullshit, you know, which may or may not even happen. I mean, that's the thing about these prescient visions is like they change. I mean, prescience is not a is not a, um, a science, you know, that's like a linear science here. I mean, I love when he talks to um, Irulan saying, does does a chip caught in a wave say where it's going? 
You know, it's just like, he's just like, he sees this stuff, but I mean, he doesn't control it. Whoa, he doesn't control it. This thing just totally broke. Hold on. Ugh. Gosh. All right. All right, hopefully it doesn't break again. <laughs> um, okay. But yeah, and then Jay Linus goes to ask about like the, the prescience ability stuff and like, could I elaborate on it? And it's like, no, because I'm not prescient. <laughs> like I'm having a hard time putting my mind around it too when he's explaining all this stuff. I'm like, wait, what? what like uh, like frank herbert was on some next level shit when he was writing this like he's so crazy um but uh yeah is it am i correct in understanding that paul cannot see the future on its own but rather potential futures based on the changing unstable present yes that is true um with that said he refers to the oracle's intellect rejecting these visions in order to subjugate them much like us the reader it makes me wonder if the quiz at Hadarach must be a mentat or have the training in order to process the visions of the universe. Uh, yeah, I think the mentat thing definitely helps. I don't know if a Kwisatz Haderach must be a mentat, but I think it absolutely helps him because that he is taking on a massive amount of information of looking at all these different possible future timelines and being able to put them, you know, together in his mind and like sort these these files in a in a very orderly computer like fashion would be would be good for him. Um, there's a lot of people asking about the Constitution thing. I think that I, I think I explained that one. So I'm going to skip some of those questions. Um, let's see here. Um, um, oh, here's, I mean, okay. So Doug Stutthoff was asking about the Constitution thing, but he comes back uh, with a third thing and he's saying, you know, trying to kind of explain it to himself as to what he thinks is going on. And he's like, well, maybe Paul is following his old man's advice from the first book. Give as few orders as possible. Once you give orders on a subject, you must always give orders on that subject. Um, so it's like, yes, I think that that's also part of it. It's like the more laws and all things that you create, it's like the, now you have, you're responsible for upholding those laws. And it's like, give as few orders as possible. You know, I think that's great advice. Um, let's see here. Uh, Jeff Kramer says, with regard to Paul's extreme resistance to the formation of a constitution, does anyone get a morbid sense of irony? Um, Paul routinely expresses his distaste for the jihad, various aspects of the imperial duties, and even for his oracle abilities due to the heavy burden they place on him. He frequently expresses his frustration with having even the smallest action of his having even the smallest action of his having exponential consequences and reper repercussions he also states his desire to return to the desert with cheney and escape yet when the idea of a constitution is introduced which may offer some stability to the universe and a place a limit on his power he immediately and aggressively rejects such a notion as much as paul dislikes the burdens of near absolute power do you think that he fears losing that power and it's like well it's not about like him having personal power it's about him like he has he has been his mind has been opened up to the race consciousness of humankind okay so he sees what humankind on a subconscious level is doing as one whole organism you know because it's like we are all humans are connected and that we have this unconscious desire and like we we as a as a one as a organism we express these desires um through these different ways and he sees you know, the human unconscious realizes that the gene pool is stagnating, that humanity is therefore stagnating. And so it has created unconsciously a situation in which now this G, this holy war jihad has happened. And what happens when people go to other nations or other planets to conquer them well not only do they kill a bunch of people but they usually fuck a bunch of people too and so now you are having these genes mingling throughout the universe um you have all of this shit going on which is like helping to uh get rid of the stagnation the genetic stagnation that's happening so it will promote diversity uh and so that the human uh, element will remain strong and not stagnate. So that's really kind of like why he's going all along with all of this. He's just like, well, this is what humanity as a whole is like going for, and that's the plan, and I'm, I'm just a part of it. Like, again, he's just a chip caught in a wave, you know, like, and he's just trying to hold it together. 
And he sees that if he just does leave and does do anything else, then it, it like everything that he's going for, you know, everything that he's trying to accomplish for the human unconscious, you know, for its needs would wouldn't happen. And that's like, well, what did he sacrifice? You know, like what is what is he doing it all for? Um <laughs> Mario asks, hi, why did Sightail choose the features for Duncan for the encounter with Farak to inspire trust with a pleasant appearance, maybe? I doubt this was without a precise reason. It's never really talked about why he chose this face. And in fact, Sightail's like, maybe this is a bad idea. Maybe I shouldn't have chosen this face. But I think part of it is trolling. I think part of it is like, in his mind, it's like, haha, I'm just going to be Duncan Idaho running out here wild and you know like he's kind of he's kind of doing he is kind of wildened a little bit by doing that um and in fact it does like this Farak does know this man's features and he's like oh this maybe wasn't the best and it's interesting because the first time we see him he's like oh this was the best I, I I chose the best perfect appearance for this awesome the second time we see him he's like oh maybe I didn't choose the best appearance for this but also um maybe he's trying to channel some of that you know Duncan Idaho chutzpah you know maybe he's trying to get a little bit of that um and two uh, is this the first time the dune tarot is mentioned in the books um i think it could be useful for people with weaker appreciation abilities like the reverend mothers to get more guide insights just like for us but i dare say it's kind of useless for a quiz that's hatterack uh, yes the dune tarot is the first this is this and the second book the dune tarot play a part in uh, there's definitely more Dune tarot shenanigans going on in Children of Dune in the third book. But after that, I don't recall it being talked about. It's certainly not something that is a problem or anything. So I think that after this book and the next book, the Dune tarot is never talked about again. Um, and Paul seems to rely only on future visions and never on past memories. Uh, something brought up only for Alia. Why is that? I don't I don't think that's true. I think that he uses his past memories too. The past memories are useful for him. Um, but again, just just like here okay, here's something. Here's some real shit. Let me let me talk to you guys. My fucking thing's all stupid looking. Okay, so here's some real shit. Uh men are builders of the future. <laughs> men are interested in building the future. Uh that's what they're interested in. Uh, generally, like, I mean, we have an entire world around us, you know, that's kind of built by, built by dudes, you know, building the future, you know, that's what they like to do is fight against the darkness and try to create order out of this chaos and turn it into something meaningful. Um, and so that's why I think that Paul is obviously more, more into, uh, building a future than he is going into his past memories, whereas Alia, uh, as a reverend mother, I mean, she goes back into her past memories more. Um, because it's like, then you can, if, you know, learning from the past, it's like, if you, if you don't learn from the past, you're doomed to make the same mistakes in the future, you know? So it's like you, she looks into the past to see like where they've been and where, what they don't need to do again, you know, to see the cycles and things like that, um, to see. So she searches within, he searches, you know, it's very feminine and masculine. It's very yin and yang, you know, yin is like feminine inward yang masculine outward so that's that's my <laughs> that's my bullshit answer um uh and i wonder how the leiloxu inserted some atreides gene cells traits into duncan it could be what irulan was not told about the gola uh alia plus modified duncan could be a valid third option for alternative to alia plus paul incest or irulan plus paul to preserve the bloodline pure for the bene Gesserit. i don't believe that they've put any Layla Atreides cells in him. I think he's like pure Duncan. He's pure Duncan. Uh, so, okay. Uh, Alex Galactus asks, is it me or does Alia and Irulan really hate each other? <laughs> yes, it's not just you. Uh, Alia has uh, definitely has distaste for Irulan. I mean, she like, she thinks Irulan is stupid and a whining shrew too, probably, and annoying, and she's a spy. Why would she like, why would she like Irulan? She's like, you're spying on my brother, you're a piece of shit. I don't like you. So yeah, they, they really don't like each other. Um, let's see here. Uh, Nicholas, someone here answer my question. Why exactly would the two pile be 
hidden if Paul uses prescience. Frank Herbert is like Yoda when explaining things. And again, I struggled with that too, like his explanation of why he could not get it. But again, it goes back to that. The one thing that I hold on to is like, I'm a chip caught in a wave. Like, does a chip say where it's going? Like, no, it's like, it's not like he can just do anything you know it's like he's not like he can just do anything and also two pile might be like you know there's a bunch of steersmen or something over there so it's like it's hidden like this whole area um that might be part of it too uh but that one yeah it was it was hard for me too bro it's not just you <laughs> like it's not just you like trying trying to wrap your head around this is pretty intense guild mintat says why are face dancers such an accepted part of society given their obvious potential to cause harm and the justifiable paranoia of the aristocracy they seem to have no controls put on their movements and get invited to the best parties um i don't know i guess they're just so lit <laughs> it's like face dancers are so lit that they get invited to cool parties um i don't know i mean it's just like i'm sh the thing is the aristocracy knows about face dancers you know like the, they would be like they would be suspicious of it they would they have certain safeguards against it i'm sure um, but yeah, I mean, I guess they're just accepted because there's really no point not accepting them. But the thing is, they, people really don't talk about, I mean, yeah, obviously they could be spies, but that's never really talked about. That's like hushed up, you know, it's like, no, 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 they're entertainers, they're entertainers. And I mean, a lot of people don't really, you know, think about things like that. You know, the average man on the street, like, what do they fucking care about a face dancer? They don't fucking care. They're just like, oh, these rich people like have these fucking mimic people who come up great, you know, and may maybe, and maybe people don't know the true extent of their powers either potentially um timothy chalamet chalamet i'm not sure how to pronounce his name uh was picked to play paul who is your pick for paul i don't really have a pick i don't really have a pick but i think that he's a good pick i like his look i like his whole thing so i'm excited we'll see where it goes you know fingers crossed i can get a, a cameo in there <laughs> um Let's see here. Teen Alia Best Girl. Yes, Jesse. Uh, Jesse Juarez says, The Fremen seem to resent changing Arrakis. It's even kind of strange to read about Stilgar sitting in a meeting with papers and folders. Yes, it is. Do you think it is natural that they would become nostalgic for their past even though their lives are better? Or after being exposed to the unknown chaos of the universe, they want to retreat back to the old chaos, the, the known chaos of old Arrakis? And again, it's just like it's change is hard for everybody. You know, of course they want to go back to when things were easier and simpler. It's like, that's one thing that happens to all of us in our lives where it's like, oh, we think we have it so hard and then something in our life changes. Our lives are never the same. And then we look back on those times that we used to complain about all the time and with, with nostalgia. We're like, oh, wow, it was so great. But that's something that humans do in general. I mean, MAGA? I mean, what do you think that is? Like, make America great again? It's manipulating people with their nostalgia for a past that never was. Uh, cause people, people, when they look back on the past, they tend to remember the good stuff and block out the painful shitty stuff. And that's just a way that your, your psyche kind of like protects itself a little bit. And so, you know, a lot of times when people look back on the past, it's like, oh, well, you don't remember the pain, the pain's gone. So you're just like, oh yeah, that was fun. That wasn't so bad. That was really cool. But meanwhile, when you're actually in the moment, it was very difficult. It was very painful. It wasn't easy either. <laughs> you know, it was not easy either. Um, but people like to, and people do like to complain about change. Nobody likes to change. It's it's chaotic. It's transformation. Um, and it's hard. It's difficult. There are unknowns. You know, when you have the safety of this idea of the past and people do want to retreat to this safety of an idea of a past that never was. I mean, it's a very human thing to do. We all do it all the time. Um, but the, the thing is, it's just appreciate what you have now, you know, like that's the real shit. It's just like, even though things may seem hard, like use your imagination and, you know, imagine shit way worse because it could always be so much worse. You know, it's like I tried not to say that you shouldn't honor your feelings or honor your pain. If you're going through something, definitely like take time to be with that. Um, don't try to hide from it or, or just, you know, oh, I'm just going to think positive. I shouldn't think negative. Like there's a reason that you are where you are and it's okay to like be be with that pain and, and honor that pain um but yeah okay all right let's see here um uh simon arsenault asked about why paul didn't send hate away but i think i i think i went over that one pretty well um <laughs> james parham asks thanks for your candid discussion of marijuana use such refreshing 
uh, super refreshing and honest. How do you think Frank Herbert viewed weed, LSD, mushrooms, etc.? They seem to have relevance in the world of Dune. Melange expands consciousness like LSD. Samuda acts with music like ecstasy. Um, I would even say it might be more like heroin. Um, I, I feel like Samuda is kind of more like heroin. It's more of like a like you chill. It's not like a stimulant. It's like a it's like a depressant. Um, and stims are widely used as a part of everyday life in the empire. As an artist who dabbles in the mystic, <laughs> have you ever used LSD, divine sage, or ayahuasca for shamanic shamanic purposes, or work through psychic blockages, or even just for shits and giggles? Um, first of all, I think that Frank Herbert was uh, really into mushrooms, and I'm not just talking about magic mushrooms. I'm talking about mushrooms. Like this guy was a mushroom farmer. He loved fungus. He was like all about, he was fascinated by it. Uh, he was so much so into mushrooms that he even created a way to grow a certain type of mushroom that is still used to this day. Like beforehand, people didn't know how to just cultivate them and grow them. And then he figured out a way to do it where you like take these mushrooms and you put them in some water or something, you make a slurry and then you dump it somewhere in particular. It was like, it's a whole thing. And this this is used today. Like, this is, he's like, that's totally, uh, Frank Herbert was absolutely into mushrooms. So I assume that he was also into the magic kind as well. <laughs> I assume, like, there's no way that he did not explore, he did not explore psychedelics and write this book. There's absolutely no way. Um, he absolutely, I mean, it's not really, it's never really openly talked about. I wish there was more discussion about it. I wish I, I could learn more about Frank Herbert and his, his use of magic mushrooms, but it's not something that's really, it's really out there as much. Um, but I'm sure he tried, I mean, I'm sure he tried some stuff uh, for sure. And uh, as for myself, uh, yes, I, I've not tried salvia and I've not tried ayahuasca yet. Uh, I would very much like to try ayahuasca. I've had a couple people that are like, oh, you know, maybe. And I'm, I'm like, just still waiting for my invitation. You have to wait to be invited. I have to wait to be invited. So I'm just waiting for my invitation. But when I get it, I'm going to totally try it. Um, I have tried LSD before. Uh, I have tried DMT before. Uh, and I absolutely use them for more shamanic purposes to work through psychic blockages, yes. Like, when I, when I do these things, it's generally less for fun and more for spiritual activities um, for me to, like, you know, face shit that's going on in my own psyche that may not be easy for me to face consciously and uh, I feel a little bit overwhelmed by. Uh, yeah, but sometimes I do for shits and giggles. Like sometimes I'll, like I went to the Ren Fair and I, I had, I wasn't like, you know, shrooming, like crazy shrooming, but it's like, I was, you know, microdosing a little bit and walking around and having a nice day and it just gives you a nice lifted elevation. I've gone to several museums on a little bit of mushrooms before and it's just like, I went to the Getty once and like, there's so many paintings there that I'm already in love with that I view every time I go there. But then like seeing them when you're just like a little bit on mushrooms, it's like, whoa, like, wow, these colors are popping. This looks even better. Like it just like it just made it look even better, you know, and going to the garden was such a magical experience. Like so. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that was definitely like a few years back. I was having a really hard time with some stuff. I was at a crossroads. I felt very trapped. I was just like really angry and upset about a lot of things. And um I was sick. I, I was just, I was at a real low point. And uh, I was like, you know what? Fuck it. Like, let's just do a, a half a tab. Uh, let's pop some LSD here. Let's fucking face my demons. Let's deal with this stuff. And uh, and I did. And I, I had a real frank conversation with myself in the mirror, you know, like me and myself talked for a little while. Me and Beans worked out a lot of stuff. It was very helpful. Uh, so it can be very helpful, but just, you know, be careful with what you're doing. Uh, don't be a fool, be an adult about it. I have to say all these things, you know, <laughs> it's like, you have to say all these things. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something that like, I would generally, when I use these things, it was more for less for fun and more for like figuring my bullshit out. And it absolutely has helped. I mean, one thing I would say about psychedelics is that, um, <sighs> I don't know, it melts your brain a little bit in a good way, <laughs> like in a, in a way that like makes things a little less sharp and like you just see, I don't know, I don't know how to describe, describe it, um, but it's been very helpful for me and I feel like it's been very positive experiences generally for me and my brain and it's helped me to think about things a little bit differently and, and widen my perception and widen my awareness. Um, 
can be a good time. You know, it can be it can be really really good for you. But also, again, it's like a lot of people like, oh, you just want to have fun on it. And it's like, no, no, no. Last time I last time I did mushrooms, I was again I was going through it was like this year. Uh, I was going through some really hard times, and I went to the desert, and I you know went to the desert by myself. I did these things. Um, I cried about a lot of stuff I needed to cry about. I confronted a lot of stuff I needed to confront. Like it just, it really helped me to kind of fast track the emotional situation that I was going through and helped me to process these feelings like, and um, faster, I guess, to where it's like, it's, it brings up all the unconscious into the consciousness for me. Uh, yeah. So let's see here. Paul, okay. Da, 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 da. Uh, Ismael Santos in over 12 years of the jihad and running the universe Paul seems even more stuck than when he was a fugitive on the sands of Arrakis on page 80 he asks himself how did I set this in motion he then says that it had set itself in motion it was in the genes how does this kind of thinking um, how does this kind of thinking of already feeling limited and stuck in his prescience go anywhere but failure compared to Farrakh's interaction with the sea during the jihad and page 62 of how he was healed of the jihad after going into the sea. Hola from Miami. Hello, Miami. Um, how does this kind of feeling, how does this kind of thinking of already feeling limited stuck go anywhere but failure? Well, it's, um, it's more than just a feeling. I mean, we see like, I mean, we see the flaw of the oracle, you know, it's like, oh, you think to yourself, oh, it'd be great to see the future. I would love to see the future. Wow, I could do all these things. I could make all this stuff happen. I could, I could take over, you know, whatever. But like, it really, like, it would be awful because it would set you on a, on a one track existence and you would feel completely caged by it. Um, It would be really messed up. So, um, yeah, it's just like he's he's stuck, man. He's stuck. Like, I like that he says, um, "I succumb to the lure of the oracle." He thought, and he sensed that succumbing to this lure might be to fix himself upon a single track life. Could it be? He wondered that the oracle didn't tell the future. Could it be that the oracle made the future? And I mean, these are the questions. You know, it's like these are the questions, my friends. Uh, it's kind of both. You know, it's like it reminds me of it reminds me of when Duke Leto died in the first book and his last thought is um, the flesh, the day shapes and the, sh- the day the flesh shapes, you know, where it's like it's both. It's like it's when you view it, you're ar- you're you're changing it. And I mean, that's something that goes on in quantum physics just by viewing an object, you change it. You know, like you are influencing it just by looking at it, you know. So it's like in a way, yes, his prescience is showing them these future timelines, but just by looking at them, he's also like creating them, you know, just by viewing them. So it's a little bit of both. Um, It's a little bit of both. And then let's see here. There's another thing that I wanted to discuss. Let me find. Oh, my gosh. I did it again. Hold on, guys. There we go. Okay. Yeah, my shit's like falling apart here, guys. Like I need some we need some new <laughs> I need to find some funding for some new headphones. These these guys have been around for a long time. Really got the money money out of them, but now it's time to kind of get some new ones, I think, for these Um, let me find. Okay, here we go. Um, his prescient power had tampered with the image of the universe held by all mankind. He had shaken the safe cosmos and replaced security with his jihad. He had outfought and outthought and outpredicted the universe of men, but a certainty filled him that this universe still eluded him. You know, it's like even with this awesome power that he wields, the universe is still one step ahead of him, you know, like it's still fucking with him. Like even though he can outfight, outthink, and outpredict the universe of men, the actual universe still got plans, you know, like and can still give him a spanking at any time. Uh, I thought that was a really great quote. That was one of my that was one of my favorite quotes. Um, another of my another of my favorite quotes. Let me just 
let me do another favorite quote here while we're where we're up when he's talking to the gola when paul's talking to hate and he's like what gives you the most pleasure paul asked unexpectedly the gola laughed and said looking for signs in others which reveal my formal my, ugh, i fucked it up looking for signs in others which reveal my former self Um, I thought that was really cool. I thought that was really beautiful that he's just like that gives him the most pleasure is looking for signs in others which reveal his former self. And I don't know. I feel like I feel like I do that a little bit where it's like not my former self, but finding out who I am by it's like you can only know who you are by comparing and contrasting yourself with other people. You know, it's like there's a lot of times where I'll be like, oh, man, like uh, like I'm not that hard of a worker, whatever. Like I could be whatever. And then like I go out and I see, you know, meet a bunch of other people. And then I'm like, oh, wait a minute. No, I'm like, I work like a lot. Like I work like a lot, like, you know, (laughs) but then, but then I hang out with some other people who are like even crazier than I am about work. And I'm like, whoa, like those guys are on some next level shit, you know, like, oh man, like I am not like going as hard as they are. And it gives you a sense of just like who you are and like what's going on and I'm always looking for myself and other people um I always I always find my and it's surprising because I find myself and other people and that's one thing that helps me to um even though I get very frustrated with humanity (laughs) I get very I I get frustrated with individuals um but I feel like when I I don't know one way to kind of combat that is um looking for signs of myself and other people just like being compassionate and being empathetic and being like oh yeah I do that too oh yeah that's also me Oh, wow. Yeah, that's totally me. And it's really interesting. I found, um, I found that, like, I call them mirror people. (laughs) I have, like, I have gotten, like, more and more and more mirror people, uh, where it's, like, you know, I think that humanity, we are all connected as a single organism, even though we don't realize it. Uh, I think we are a single organism as well as a collection of individuals. And, um, we don't know how much we serve the greater purpose, but we do, and it's, and it's very much unconscious. Um, but like, wait, where was I going with this? I was like, oh God, I don't know. Um, humanity is a bag of cats, and I'm a bag of cats, and we're all a bag of cats. And I'm trying to figure out, I don't know, just trying to like see, like I said, see myself and other people. Another thing that's actually really helped me, another thing that's really helped me with like being frustrated is realizing that we're all children like we're all children like all of us like we're all just like scared children you know and so a lot of times when I see people like doing like fucked up shit and like crazy stuff like stuff that's like self-destructive or destructive to other people it's just like you have to remember it's like no they're a child they're a child you know like you can't can't get mad at a six-year-old because they don't know because they're just a kid you know it's like they just don't know and that's something that kind of helps me helps me get through it you know also uh my cat (laughs) having a relationship with my cat is really helpful and actually it's so funny you want to talk about like seeing yourself and other people and so you just have to kind of you have to gauge these situations you have to use your powers of arbitration you know again this goes back to um this goes back to law you know we're talking about constitutions and laws it's like, you know, everybody wants a law to make things like really s- to simplify things for them so they don't have to think. You know, laws are for people who don't want to think and want to be told what to do because they don't want to have to deal with it themselves because it's hard to figure out what's right and what's wrong sometimes. You know, it's difficult. Um, and so you need people need laws because they want to be told what to do, you know. And uh, no, like... You know, I I don't know. I don't want laws. I don't want to be told what to do. I'd rather have arbitration where I just have to, like, kind of figure it out on my own, you know. And it's like with beans, it's like you just got to figure it out. There's no law. You know, yeah, people hear a cat whine and they're like, that means no, don't touch that cat. But that's not what she really means. Like, she likes it. It's part of the whole process. But I had to figure that out and it took me a long time to figure that out and it took me several tries um and like to you know. And then sometimes she really does mean it, though. And it's like you have to, again, you have to use your powers of intuition and your powers of observation to realize to arbitrate what's going on in this scenario does she mean does no mean no right now or does no mean yes right now you know you got to figure it out that's life you know (laughs) that's that's life um but yeah so uh 
thank you, Red Sonia's mate, for subscribing. I saw your uh, I, your Red Sonia's mate is hilarious. By the way, that's a really good. I laughed when I saw that name. You guys have some really funny names on here. Um, so uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, question, are you sure you would be Satanic Kualdo? Are you sure you'd be a Bene Gesserit? They look so orderly. Um, you know, later on in the books, we have, uh, we have a couple of characters, some Bene Gesserit characters that I feel like I really, Shiana in particular is a Bene Gesserit that like, she was a little, she comes from nothing and from nowhere. So, like, I feel like of all of the Bene Gesserit, Shiana is the one that I feel like I would probably fit in with the most. Um, where it's like, yeah. And honestly, okay, let me tell you some fucked up weird shit. It's not fucked up weird shit. But I feel like earlier in my life, I did think about, I did entertain the idea of joining the military. You know, I was like, as somebody who is a chaotic individual, like there is that longing for structure, you know, like there, like even I long for structure, even though I'm a fucking crazy chaos being, there's a part of it. And the thing about, the thing about a system is you can work a system, you know, and that's the thing about chaos being is just like, okay, you can work a system and like do something with this, you know, and, and make something and, and rise. I'm, I'm somebody who would be able to rise up, I feel like, in a situation like that. Um, and it might be in certain ways good for me, you know, but in other ways, but it's like, again, I couldn't do it because I was like, no, I can't, you know, it's, I, I really don't like being told what to do. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, yeah, okay. So Jorgensen, you say, yeah, the most chaotic friends I had from high school all went to the military. Totally. I mean, it's something where it's like, yeah, you're chaotic, but like you need something that can like whip you into shape, you know, because you're so fucking crazy. You need something to like really like something much bigger than you to take that chaos and mold it into something that's usable. And so that's something why I love the Bene Gesserit is like, yeah, they take the, this chaos and they mold it into something usable. And like, you know, I, but I like the, and there's also like wild reverend mothers and stuff like that too. But I think Shiana would be the one, even though I love Darwi O'Drade, Darwi O'Drade is definitely my favorite female character in all of the Dune series. She comes in Chapter House and Heretics of Dune. And I have so much fucking respect for her. Like, it's just, like, crazy. Like, she's so awesome. Um, and I, I like to try to, like, channel those those things into me because that's one thing where it's, like, you know, I, I love the um, – there's this one quote that's, like – what is it? There's this one Dune quote where it says, um, seek freedom or seek liberty – or no, seek freedom and become captive of your desires – seek discipline and find your freedom uh and it's like that's so true you know it's so true that like if you if you just follow whatever whim you're on you know you're just going to end up doing whatever you want to do which isn't necessarily what you need to be doing um because you're, you're going to go towards more pleasurable activities which don't make you harder faster stronger or better you know you're going to go towards things that are not painful experiences um, you're going to go towards pleasurable experiences and we don't learn from pleasure you learn from pain uh, and you learn from discipline and you learn from hard times it's like there's another quote where there needs to be a science of discontent people need hard times and oppression to develop psychic muscles and that's something that's absolutely true and so even though I am very I realize that I'm a very chaotic person I do try to um, you know I am seeking uh ways to discipline myself I don't I'm at a point now where I don't need someone to tell me what to do I need to tell me what to do and then I need to go do those things you know like it's it's I need to do those things like for example uh one thing that I I feel really proud of that I've I've been you know slowly changing in my life is uh I've been going to the gym I've been going to the gym pretty regularly like pretty much every other day uh, and I'm starting to like create a pattern and started to create a repetition. And I found that uh, it's been really great for me. It's like this discipline that I'm developing uh, is really healthy for me in a lot of ways. It's something that's hard and painful. Working out is not fun. It's you're pushing, you're sweating, you're grunting, you know, it's like, but at the same time, uh, it's good for me. And this discipline is something that I'm developing in myself. And it's something that I'm hoping that I can make into a lifelong discipline of something where I'm, you know, consistently taking care of my body and working out. 
uh, because it's really important to take care of yourself, especially if you want to do big things. I mean, it's like I'm at capacity with how much stuff I can do right now. And if I want to do more than I'm doing right now, then I need to be in even better shape. And I honestly haven't been taking great care of myself over the past few years. I really have not been doing the self-care that I need. And so this discipline of going to the gym uh, with my friend Josh and training and doing all this stuff uh, has been really helpful. But also, also though, I'm not just, I, you also have to give yourself a motivation that's like a real practical motivation. Because here's the thing. I wouldn't like, okay, my practical motivation for working out to get me started in this discipline is the not safe for work calendar. Um, the calendar that I'm creating, it's like nothing will make you more serious about getting in shape than being on camera taking pictures with no clothes on. Um, that's something that you're like, oh, wow, I really can't hide anything. I should really get, like, that's such, like, that's the best motivation you have. I mean, honestly, like, being on camera has been really good for me in a lot of ways because it has made me, like, be a lot more aware and conscious of, of what I'm eating, what I look like, how I'm taking care of myself, like, all of these things. And so I have a practical reason of why I'm getting in shape. It's not just because, like, oh, I want to look better for me. You know, it's like, no, it's like for a practical thing. I have to do that to motivate myself. I have to have practical reasons of why I'm doing things. And so this is my practical reason to get it started. Hopefully I can keep it up after I'm done. Um, but yeah. So yeah, discipline is good for you, but self-discipline, you know, like sometimes we need other people though. Because like Josh has been, I mean, Josh has been the, the backup discipline because he's the one training me. So it's like, you know, he'll be like, oh, let's push a little harder, or how are you feeling, or, you know, let's put some more weight on there, da 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 So it's like I have someone else, too, to make sure that I'm pushing myself um, as hard as I, I should be, or telling me to not push myself so hard. Sometimes he's like, hey, we don't need to go really heavy on this rep. We need to take a break in between because that gives your muscles a break, and you don't need to push it the entire time, um, and so I'm like, okay, so we do less. Uh, so yeah. Um, Neuromats, you need to quit social media and online video games. Um, yeah, I mean, I can see that. It, it can be, it can be difficult. Like these things really can take over your life really fast, uh, and they can become crutches. And I mean, I use social media too much too. But I mean, it's part of my job, so it's like that's how I like make it okay to myself. But then there's an, the other part of me that kn that knows when I'm on there not for my job, and I'm just dicking around and wasting my time. And it's like, oh, instead of going and doing something productive like meditating today. I scrolled through fucking Facebook like an asshole, you know? It's like, that's like a waste of my time, you know, just when you're just scrolling. We all do it. You're just scrolling, uh, because you just want to turn your brain off for a minute and, like, just, you know, see what pops up, see if a meme comes up that makes you laugh or something, you know? <laughs> like, I'm always, I'm always scrolling for those memes. I'm always scrolling for those memes. But, yeah, everything in moderation, even moderation. Um, I'm going jock this year, uh, by the way. Just, 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 yeah, look at that. Bam! I made that this year. That wasn't there before. This guy wasn't there before. Um, so I'm really excited. I know. There's my girl beef. Yeah, I'm getting swole. I'm getting those Sarah Connor arms, fam. Uh, yeah, meme economy. It is the, it is the thing. It is the, it's the OG marketplace. Um, but yeah, so, but there's ways of like, here's the thing though, is like when a lot of us, when we try to go start a new discipline and try to like cut something out of our lives or start doing something, we're always like all or nothing, you know, and I feel like definitely, um, you know, quitting things cold turkey isn't necessarily always the best option. Weaning yourself off is a better option, but that takes more self-discipline to wean yourself because you have to see what you're doing, be honest with how much you're doing it, and then slowly over time make sure that you stop doing what you're doing and not get dragged back in you know but that takes a lot of self-discipline and that takes a lot of you know stuff that you have to really take an honest look at your life whereas you know oh if I go cold turkey then okay I'm done you know you don't have to think about it you don't have to watch yourself it's just you well, I mean you have to watch yourself but it's just like you, you've given yourself a law again it's like you've given yourself a law where you're like no more video games instead of you know hey maybe I should just play them less. You know, I can play video games in a healthy manner, but I'm not doing that right now. How do I get it down to where I'm, I'm doing this in a way that's healthy and non-destructive for me? Um, and sometimes you do need to take, but sometimes you do need to hard quit. Sometimes that is like the cold turkey thing is, is an option to explore, but also don't be afraid to explore other options. I think, and I think a lot of people fall off of whatever their resolutions are because they go too hard at first. You know, it's like, no, just kind of be gentle on yourself. Like, 
you don't have to be hard on yourself on top of everything that you're doing like just try to be try to be whatever um so yes uh krista bat we are in the q a now i'm just kind of like talking though uh <laughs> uh satanical though question how is life on two pile i don't know probably sick it's probably chill i don't know though but you probably have a bunch of aristocratic motherfuckers hanging out just like oh i'm so glad i don't have responsibility anymore you know but i don't know maybe it sucks who knows um let's see here all right guys um so give me some more questions uh yeah. Oh, neuromance. Like Jordan Peterson says, don't be a tyrant to yourself. You will rebel. Absolutely. I'm a tyrant to myself all the time. And I have to constantly tell myself, stop being so hard on yourself. Stop being so hard on yourself. Negative self-talk. That's something that me and Akira talked about. Um, negative self-talk. You know, be aware of how you're talking to yourself in your brain. Are you being really hard on yourself? You're going, oh, stupid. You're stupid. Oh, shut up. You shouldn't have done this. Da, 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 da. Like, stop. You don't, like, life's hard enough. You don't need to be scolding yourself on top of it. And that's something that I'm guilty of and something that I'm trying to also be more aware of and to uh, replace it with more, not necessarily like, positive self-talk. I don't think that that's the answer either. A lot of people go from like, oh, you don't need to be negative, so you need to be positive all the time. And it's like, no, it's more about being neutral. You know, there's a third option. It's called neutrality, <laughs> where you're just like, you know, you're not super hard on yourself, but you're not like, you know, sucking your own dick either. You know, you're just kind of like, hey, I'm doing this. I could be better at this, uh, but I could be worse. You know, go with that. Find that middle path. You know, find the middle path. Um, uh, question. So Jorgensen asks, so this new phase in your hair color, where is it going? It looks fabulous. Um, well, I've got the blue started. I got I'm starting some of the blue. Um, so we're transitioning from the green to the blue, my blue period. I'm not ready yet uh, to go more blue, but as we go along, I'm heading into the blue phase. Uh, but I'm not ready to give up green yet. I still have some green adventures. Uh, I'll know when the time is right. The time has not been right yet. So uh, yes, uh, Sparky asks, I've heard you refer to the human organism many times in Dune Club. I'm curious, have you also read the Foundation series where Asimov used that idea as well? Um, I did read the first Foundation book and I, I wasn't into it. I feel like such a loser because like I should told like I, it's not like I don't respect Asimov. I just couldn't get into his writing style. It was very dry um and it was just like the, the there wasn't enough character there for me because it very much is about the simulation that he's running and the story that he's running and less about the characters and i need more of that character to kind of hold on to i need more of that human element so i had a difficult time reading the first foundation book but i'm going to give it another go at some point in my life i'm not sure when that's going to be but at some point i will go back and i will read the foundation i haven't done the whole series my uncle keeps telling me my uncle who's like super original gangsta dune guy uh, he's read all of the Dune books. He's like, you, you think I'm an authority on Dune? Dude, my uncle is far more an authority on Dune than I am. Where do you think I got it from? <laughs> and um, and he loves the Foundation series. He's always trying to get me to read it. He's like, you should totally read the Foundation series. And I'm like, I will at some point. Uh, uh, uh. I just tried the first one and I wasn't like, I wasn't, uh, wasn't into it, you know? Um... Christo Bat, do you see a relationship between the Benny Lilacs and the resurgence of cyberpunk dot artificial human trend in the media? Um, well, I mean, the Benny Lilacs, I don't know if I'd see, like, I mean, of course there's a relationship because they, they don't give a fuck. Like, they're just messing with anything. Like, it's, they'll put distrans stuff in people. They don't care. Like, they just see what they can make, see what they can do. Uh, they don't have, like, a bunch of, like, crazy morality stuff like many other people, like the Bene Gesserit do. It's like, the Bene Gesserit might be fucked up, but at least they have, like, <laughs> at least they're, like, <sighs> they're not as messed up as other people, you know? Um, but, yeah, I, I don't know. I'm really worried about this whole art of, like, this whole human technological interface that we're inevitably going towards. We're inevitably going to have the human digital interface at some point and for me it's something that like uh like I, i'm gonna be like that grandma you know where it's like like all these kids are gonna have like fucking ports and shit and like all this stuff and they'll be able to send brain emails and stuff like that and i'm just gonna be like you're not putting a port in me sunny jim back in my day we just got on a computer we had a phone you know like we didn't have a brain stuff like i i, I just can't see myself 
getting on with like implanting things but maybe i don't know maybe i'll change my mind i mean who knows but i just it feels creepy to me it feels really creepy it feels really weird it's like i already don't like the fact that i can be spied on through my computer and my phone and like everything else so it's like oh i'm gonna put a chip in my brain so people can spy on my brain too yeah right do you want ads in your brain nope nope like that would be the worst um, as much as we think that we want to be more connected with one another i think that connecting our brains together like that might be a really bad idea uh in a lot of ways um okay orange beak says what happened to fade Rauth's daughter is she just some random Benny jazz right now i don't know we'll never know maybe it's i don't know if it's brought up in the brian herbert books whatever happens with the daughter of lady Margot and fade Rautha. Uh, but I, in the Frank Herbert series, she's never brought up again, which sucks because I would kind of like to know what happened with her too. Um, let's see here. Uh, Club Ad Noob asks, how do you prepare or research for each session of the book club? And do the colors of your hair have a personal meaning? Um, well, what I do is I read the session, um, and then I go through... I, I do make notes. I underline. You can kind of see some of my underlines here. I, I dog ear pages. I star things. Um, I write ha ha in the margins. I also go f at the beginning of every chapter. I say what who's in this chapter. Kind of what's going on in this chapter. Uh, you know. So I got a lot of that. You know. This. I do a lot of like stars. And I say this. This is awesome. Um, so I read it. And then, uh, and then I sit down and it takes me about, it takes me like a day to really get in the headspace and really write my outline. And I, I sit down, I'm not a writer, I'm not a great writer. I sit down and I write my overview first. I start with my overview and I'm like, okay, what happened? How do we condense this down into a paragraph that just overviews everything that we read? And then I go through chapter by chapter. And then I break down the chapter and just like reread it again think about the thing you know I, I look at the things I underlined I looked at the things I dog ear I have that because that kind of helps re me remember like what I was thinking when I was reading it uh and then I just sit there and stare at a computer screen and I'm like what the fuck do I want to say about this and like and it's really this class is really great because it forces me to really think about things that are like normally as a reader I would pass up and just be like oh I don't understand that oh I'll keep going but having to do this I'm really forced to confront ideas that I don't fully understand and really try to think about them um and yeah and I also just kind of think about it throughout the week and stuff like that just percolate on it you know and I already read the book earlier I read the book again earlier this year so I like preloaded it and then now I'm like redoing it again and like I read it a couple times you know throughout the week so uh yeah and um yeah does my hair have any um I've said I've said this before but I'll, I'll add on to it uh, I went green when Trump became president because I felt like we had entered a new wacky alternate timeline and I was very pink before and green is the opposite of the color wheel. So I thought that green would be cool because it would show like that we flipped, you know, like we flipped into some some other crazy wacky alternate timeline. Uh, but also there's I mean, I don't do ev I don't do anything for one reason. There's always myriad layers of reasons of why I do everything and so there's way more to it than just that um, it was also and this came to me later is I mean I was doing like an orange yellow pink thing before I went to the green and like I I've been kind of making my way through the rain I realized I've been making my way through the rainbow I started at purple I went with pinks and purples then I did like pinks and oranges and yellows and then I'm now I'm doing yellows and greens. And then now the blue is peeking in. Then I'm going to fade into the blue and then do the blue period. And then do, I guess, go back to purples, blues and purples. Uh, and then I just, I want to make my entire way through the rainbow. So there's that. And then there's also, um, I've been really trying to work on my heart chakra. I've been working with my heart energies. I've been trying to touch those energies and release those things and kind of clear those things out. And so the heart chakra is associated with the color green. So this is also kind of like a, a thing of like, while I'm really trying to, to work on, you know, wo the wounds of my heart, <laughs> um, uh, that's a good reminder for that. And also, you know, yellow in particular, like I remember I did this, um, I did this like one of those like stupid 
quizzes, you know, like I love those little personality quizzes online. And, um, and it was like, what is the color of your shadow? And I was like, ooh, what does that mean? That sounds cool. Because I'm always like trying to do shadow work. And like I've been, that's another thing is like I've been doing a lot of shadow work uh, in my life and trying to make the unconscious conscious. And, um, and it said that my shadow was the color yellow. And I was like, what? And then it said that my shadow is that I'm actually a really happy person and that um, I don't let that out enough. Like I, I don't, I'm like actually like my natural state is actually really fucking happy and excited. And it's just like all of the shit around me, I let it get to me. And then I, I don't let my happy out. I don't, I'm, I don't shine that yellow that, that I am. And so, um, so the yellow has also been partially a reminder to like be happy and like let that happy person out. Um, it's actually really interesting. Um, like the yellow... I don't know, it's really interesting, like, we're going back to the mushroom conversation. Like, I feel like a lot of times, like, I have a lot of anxiety in my life. And uh, I, I just am a very high-strung person. I overthink things. I'm constantly analyzing and weighing things, like, all the time. I just cannot seem to cut my brain off. That's why I've been trying to practice meditation to help me kind of get more of a control on my monkey mind. Um, because it's just constantly going a million miles an hour. And I'm always trying to like look into future timelines and try to guide myself as best I can into this future. Um, and it's really stressful. And like, I find that when I am specifically on mushrooms, uh, I feel like a lot of that anxiety goes away. I feel like a lot of the things that I worry about, all the anxieties that I have are, are really fucking menial and stupid and mundane. And a lot of them are lifted off of me. And I'm finally able to kind of be what's underneath all of that which is like a, a very happy bright and sparkly person you know and I mean that's one thing that I've definitely like something I struggle with is I, I know that underneath all of the you know tattoos and the crazy hair and all this stuff like I'm a very light being and the world has kind of forced me to <laughs> the world has like had me forced me for a while I, I was hiding my light and hiding my my shiningness and stuff to protect myself because it just wasn't I don't know the the world's hard you know it's really dark and, and like you, you stare into dark shit it fucks you up and so it's like there's definitely like and it's so funny because I was talking to this I have a friend she's my birthday twin we were both born same day same year uh and she's another one of those mirror people I was t oh yeah that's what I was going to tell you about mirror people she's another one of those mirror people and like there was one point you know where she was talking about like how like she was telling me a lot of dark stuff that has gone on in her life. And she's seen a lot more darkness than even I have. You know, I mean, she's been through a lot. She's experienced a lot of stuff and seen a lot of stuff. And that really happy, sparkly girl that she really is on the inside has been, you know, pushed down, you know, by all of this darkness that she's seen. And it's like one of the things that both of us have to work on is re a return to innocence. You know, like we both our innocence was lost you know we lost our innocence kind of young you know by by through circumstances and through being exposed to darkness when we weren't prepared for it uh and uh having to kind of struggle through it anyways and like that's i don't know that's some real shit so the yellow is is me trying to get back on that um <laughs> so yeah um, also mirror people i totally forgot to tell you about mirror people yeah I, there's all these people that I see and I'm like you guys are like mirror images of me you know it's like I see all these people where it's like you're going through so much like I see exactly where you're going through because I'm there and like I'm totally but it's like flipped you know it's always like something's a little different like for example this girl being a mirror person it's like she is going kind of the opposite way that I am going you know like she's trying to like kind of break into the mainstream and like do all this stuff and like has to um you know pretend to be this perfect you know squeaky clean person you know because I mean as we all know like tweet anything your whole life could be over from seven years ago um so she's like going on that path I'm going the opposite way we're like I'm gonna just be as crazy as I can you know but like we're both very similar at the end you know it's like where it's like I'm not nearly as fucking crazy as like I make myself out to be and she's not as good as she makes herself out to be you know what I'm saying like we're both somewhere in the middle um, but it's fun to kind of watch each other like go in these like different directions and like she's she's doing certain things that like I always wanted to do and I'm doing certain things that she always wanted to do and in a way we can both kind of vicariously live through one another while also staying on our own path. Um, but yeah, <laughs> so uh, yeah, 
transhumanism is creepy though i'm gonna go back okay so let's see is there any is there any digitally uploading consciousness christo asked about digitally uploading consciousness oh, god that sounds like such a bad idea oh my lord that's like so scary like i really think about that and that sounds like some fucking dark arts like black magic stuff like you, why would you want to trap your consciousness on this plane of existence why would you trap yourself here this is the lowest plane of existence why would you trap yourself on malkuth why would you do that that sounds like a terrible idea like you would be trapping yourself like I don't know. I, I think that digitally uploading consciousness, while also while in one way is really fascinating and an interesting idea and like, whoa, at the same time, it's like, it seems like a fucking, like you're, you're trapping yourself in hell. Like, why would you do that? Like, would you, do you really want to live forever? Like, do you really want your consciousness to live forever? Like, yikes. I mean, we all see vampires and they get super old and then they're like done with it and they just want to die, like, because they're just done. Like, I mean, nobody wants to go on forever. We live in a finite universe. Um, although I would think it would be cool if, like, you know, the, the movie Her, where, uh, they had, they had an AI consciousness, you know, and, um, the AIs got together and they created an Alan Watts consciousness because there's so many recordings of him speaking, um, and there's so much information and he's, he's written books, you know, I mean, there's so much stuff online, uh, about this man and his personality and these AIs were able to get together and resurrect uh, an approximation of what Alan Watts's consciousness would be like and uh, and so now there's an AI Alan Watts running around you know like resurrected and it's like that's cool to me like that idea does not creep me out because it's not it's a little different you know it's like it's I don't know. And it's also funny to me because I was thinking about how, like, I'm all over the internet. There's so many videos of me, like, so much raw material. And it's like, if a bunch of AIs got together at one point, they could totally make a comic book girl AI running around and, like, just fucking shit up on the internet. And that would be awesome. And that would be a cool way to live on. Uh, <laughs> that would be a neat way. But I don't want to trap my own consciousness on this sphere of existence. No. I would like to leave at some point. Hopefully not soon. <laughs> I, I feel like I got a lot of st lot stuff to do. Uh, but I don't know if I would want to upload my fucking consciousness anywhere. Um, so let's see here. Uh, um, do you, t do I talk with my Dune loving uncle between sessions? I don't. Uh, I actually haven't talked to him in a long time. I should talk to him. I get, I get a little butthurt cause like he doesn't really like, he doesn't really like, I don't know. He kind of thinks everything I'm doing is fucking stupid seemingly. And so it's just like, I don't know. I'm just like don't really he doesn't really get it like what I'm doing necessarily so we just kind of like don't talk as much because it's like hard to explain to him but at the same time I don't know understand everything that he's doing either it was so funny one time we were hanging out and I was trying to explain to him what I do <sighs> couldn't get it he tried to explain to me what he does <sighs> couldn't get it you know so we just have to agree to not disagree but I don't know just uh uh whatever my uncle's he's a wild he's a wild one he's a wild one but he's not here uh i mean it'd be funny to have him on this show but he's not here but I, he's also not camera ready i don't think that he would want to be on the internet i don't think he would want to be on camera he was just like would not he is not um he's a lot more conservative than i am let's just say oh also too another thing about the green hair another thing about the green hair is uh it's definitely like green and yellow or like phoenix colors like happy phoenix colors and so um i just feel like i'm doing i'm 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 channeling a lot of shit right now so i'm like i have that happy phoenix thing going on uh, i could go dark at any minute though guys so be careful just uh, <laughs> i'm really trying to not go dark uh, but i have in the past uh when my hair was fire that 2016 that was like that was my dark phoenix year i was just like whoa you know when my hair looked like fire that was definitely when i was doing some dark phoenix business um um <laughs> can you tell us about your parents in childhood and cry you know what i've done a lot of crying lately i'm gonna, I'm gonna save that for another time <laughs> But again, you know, it's like, again, it wasn't all bad, you know, it's like, it wasn't, it's like, there was, again, it's like, yeah, it had its dark moments, but it also had its really awesome moments too. 
Um, and I'm really grateful for everything that I've gone through and everything that I that has happened to me because it had all Every, all things serve the beam, you know, like all th- like I really love who I am as a person and everything that's happened to me, good or bad, good or bad, has contributed to who I am today. Uh, and so I'm just grateful for for everything. You know, I just I just try to be grateful for everything because it has. And that was one thing when I was talking to my friend, you know, and she was telling me about a lot of dark stuff. I was like, well, if you hadn't gone through these experiences, you wouldn't be able to do the things you're doing right now because you learned how to deal with this then. And then now this is how you're using it. And she was like, oh, yeah, like totally, you know. So um, it's important to, to remember that. Uh, let's see here. Um, <laughs> Do you think that the Joan of Arc was a potential Kwisatz Haderach? I mean, she definitely, Joan of Arc was definitely had some Paul Atreides shit going on where she got a bunch of people to follow her and like do some stuff and like they believed that she was talking to God, you know, whether she was or not, I don't know, you know, but uh, something was going on with her, you know, like something was going on with her, like uh, who knows. Um, but I don't know, I don't think she could see the future necessarily, I don't know. Maybe she could, I don't know. Maybe she, I haven't done enough research on her recently. She's like dust, I have a, my, my Joan file in my head's kind of dusty. Um, let's see here. Yeah, the Lightbringer. Danica the Lightbringer. Thank you, I am a Lightbringer. Um, yeah, my name means the Morning Star, which is the bringer of the dawn. So uh, yes, that, that is definitely some one of my functionalities. I take it very seriously. Um, Mm-hmm. Cloak and yeah, cloak and Danica the dagger. I know, right? I know this thing is still falling apart. Oh gosh. Ah, here we go. I know I would make a good dagger. I would make a good dagger. But again, she. I always thought though that like her outfit. I was just like, that's so dazzler. You know, like I get confused sometimes. You'll see her out of the corner of your eye. Like, is that dazzler? And it's like, no, it's cloak or no, it's it's dagger. It's dagger, dazzler, and dagger, and they have a very similar costume, uh, and they both have light powers. You know, although I'd rather be I'd rather be dazzler because dazzler's the shit. Um, let's see here. Uh, any other questions? Hmm. Let me look in here. Do, do, do. What the hell is Malkuth? Okay, Magnus Danger. Uh, what the hell is Malkuth? Malkuth is on the, um, in the Kabbalah, in the, in, on the tree of life. You know, there's like a diagram. There's all these spheres. There's 10 spheres. And uh, at the very bottom is Malkuth. And Malkuth represents the physical realm, the physical realm that we live in, you know, where, I mean, all the other, all the other spheres are non-corporeal. Um, so this is where, you know, the, um, this is where the divine manifests itself in the physical form. And so, yeah, it's like if, you know, if you're like an occult magician dude, you know, you're going to try to like, you want to level up, you know, you want to get to those higher spheres of consciousness, you know, like this is the lowest sphere of it where, where consciousness crystallizes into matter, you know, it's like consciousness is crystallized into matter here. So it's like, it's really like the ass end of the tree and it's the fertilizer, it's the shit that uh that that i think you know fertilizes the tree and like keeps it going um but i wouldn't want to be here forever uh i wouldn't want to be here forever um i mean isn't that something though like all you know us uh, us millennials bond over like you know dying like there's so many memes about how like (laughs) like wanting to die (laughs) and they're so good and i do love them uh i'm a really big fan uh uh one iOS asks what do you think about Westworld I find it really cool I watched the first season I enjoyed it although I found it very frustrating um but I was so frustrated my my frustration won out over over the pleasure that I got from watching the show and I have not watched uh the rest of Westworld although I've heard a lot of people say that they're doing some Dune stuff they're doing some Quizzats Hatterack type of stuff and I'm kind of I'm kind of like interested in checking it out but like not interested enough where I don't know if I'll actually do it. Um, yeah. Uh, let's see here. By the way, guys, Alan Watts, for real. Like, go check that guy out. He's so cool. Um, hmm. What would you... 
Christabet, would you want a CBG-19 bot approximation for future generations? Um, well, yeah, that's that's funny to me. Like, that's a hilarious idea as a CBG-19 bot because, like, man, she would probably be fucking shit up. Like, that would be really funny to me. I mean, it'd be, like, it'd be... Like, right now, it's like, yeah, you could turn yourself into, like, a, you know, a cartoon character and, like, live on that way in certain ways. But it's like, man, having a fucking uh, a bot? Wow, that would be really cool. Um, that would be really cool. Um, let's see here. <laughs> oh, you, uh, Davey, you said that I should be Dagger and then Dax could be Cloak. That would be really funny, actually. That would be pretty awesome if he was Cloak. Um, all these little, he's... I don't know how tall Cloak is. Like, Dax is so fucking tall. But then whenever I see him, he's always, like, wearing heels and in drag. And it's just, like, a, a billion feet tall. Um, question. The old Atreides asks, what is so compelling about the mother of chaos born in the ocean and how this healed Farak of the Jihad? Um, I took that to mean, and it took me a minute to think about this. Again, it's like I had to, like, take a minute where I was like, what? The mother of chaos was born in the sea? What the fuck does that mean? Um, but, like... I don't know, he was healed of the jihad, you know, like he was healed of all this nonsense and this Fremen ideology and all this like crap that he's been told, like, and he finally kind of saw things for himself and saw how little and insignificant he is and how much he doesn't know, you know, and all this stuff. And like, it created chaos in him, you know, because now he could no longer be controlled. You know, he could no longer be controlled by the things that control the others, you know, that he was with. Um, and so, you know, he's... Uh, and also, it's like I think of, like, chaos as, like, love, you know? It's like he said he was healed of, of the jihad, you know? He was healed of this need to, like, go out and murder people, you know? It's like he sees this. He's inspired by this awe. And, like, now it's just like, I don't need to do any of this, you know? It's like I think that that was part of it as well. Um, <sighs> question. Do I ever see my old videos and face my younger self? Sometimes. Sometimes. It is, I usually, I'm, like, really embarrassed before, if anyone puts on something, like, an old video of me, I'm like, oh, no, I was probably an idiot, what did I say, Ugh, and I get, like, really self-conscious, but then when I actually watch it, I'm generally, like, laughing, and then I'm like, oh, yeah, she's right, oh, yeah, I totally agree with her, like, it's, it's so funny, because, like, before I watch it, I'm always have this, like, nervous anxiety about like what the fuck did I say what did I do oh my god it was probably awful and then I watch it and I'm like oh my god this is hilarious like she's great <laughs> like I agree I agree with this girl I, yes 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 um so every now and then I do do that and it's interesting um and it's interesting to just like see where you were you know because it's like gosh I've changed so much in six years since we've started this um I've changed so much you know I really feel like the internet made a woman out of me you know, I was a girl before, but I mean, that's another thing why I'm struggling with like, do I keep the comic book girl named Teen Handle is I just, I don't feel like a girl anymore. I'm a fucking woman, you know, like I want to be treated as such. And if I go around saying I'm a girl, that keeps you like that, you know? So there's like a part of me that is interested in branching out away from that um, because it's limiting in a lot of ways. I find it very limiting. Um, at first it was very empowering, but now uh it's it's kind of becoming the opposite in certain ways um peachy bloom says do you think our visceral fear fear of these new technologies is similar to nostalgia and animosity that the fremen feel um and it's like i mean yeah totally uh it's just it's fear of the unknown you know because that's the thing is like these new technologies like how is it going to change everything i mean technology's already changed things so much and i think we're all a little tired I think everyone on the planet is just like we've evolved a lot in the past like hundred years like things have really changed and so it's like oh now there's this technology and this tech and this you know and you're just like dude like where the fuck is this going I mean one thing that was interesting um, is I just learned that there's such a thing as a four thousand dollar refrigerator that has Wi-Fi and cameras on the inside that you can check on your with an app you can check on your phone you can talk to it you can you can tell it things, it can talk to you, it's got internet connectivity and all this shit. And I was just like, I immediately started thinking about how someone could hack it. I was like, someone could hack your fucking, like if I was, a, if I was uh, in a darker place, a real dark place, and I was annoyed with people who would have the money to buy a $4,000 refrigerator 
and I was a genius hacker person, I might be tempted to hack into people's stupid fucking refrigerators and just like fuck with it and like fuck with them and have ice spit out everywhere, have water spit out everywhere, turn it turn it too hot or too cold in there. Um, you, I mean, there's so many things you could do, you know, it's just like we talk, oh, yeah, we're, we're going to make everything connected. And it's like, yeah, when we do that, what happens when the hackers get in and fuck everything up? You know, like that was something that I an idea that I saw in uh, Ghost in the Shell uh, series later. I'm not talking about the original. I'm talking about later. They show that like, you know, there's this um, like people don't really drive. It's like there's this grid and like this uh, everything's connected and these cars are all driving, you know, being driven essentially. And these like hackers get in and they just like fuck everything up and cause all this fucking chaos, you know. And it's just like, yeah, like once you connect everything like this, it's like now people are going to get in and like fuck shit up. And like there's a lot of weird things that we're not even thinking about that people could do with it. Um Let's see here. Uh, Dark Phoenix versus, versus Thanos. Who would win? Dark Phoenix. Um, let's see here. <laughs> um, oh, thank you. Thank you for saying I have a good head on my shoulders. And I'm super cute. Thanks. I try. So cuteness is one of my mutant powers. <laughs> um, Digital Legend 1. I think that way at your... Um, I don't know. That, that's a weird question. Hold on. Let me, let me keep going. Light, no. 